Good evening, and welcome to the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, COVID-19 National Grand Rounds. I'm Dr. Ian Martin, President of SAEM and System Chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. For those of you joining us for the first time, SAEM is the premier international organization representing researchers and educators in emergency medicine. In our work, SAEM promotes and facilitates scientific discovery, educational innovation, and the professional and leadership development of our members. Tonight, we are proud to bring to you from the new international epicenter of this pandemic, a COVID-19 presentation entitled, Lessons Learned from an Academic Health System in New York City. During this presentation and during our questions and answer session, you will hear from 10 emergency medicine faculty members coming from the Departments of Emergency Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine and Columbia University. They will each share their experiences fighting the COVID-19 pandemic in one of the hardest hit cities in the world, providing along the way guidance and insight that will likely prove invaluable to the rest of us as we brace for a surge of patients in our own communities. During the presentation, you may submit questions for the presenters by clicking the Q&A button in your Zoom menu interface. Questions that are upvoted will be prioritized during our questions and answer session to start immediately after our presenters have concluded. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Drs. Angela Mills and Raul Sharma. Dr. Mills is the J.E. Beaumont Professor and Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Columbia University. And Dr. Sharma is Professor and Chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine. Welcome to you both and thank you for being here. So Dr. Mills, would you briefly tell us what it's been like to care for patients in New York City since this pandemic began? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Martin and SAM for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. It's an honor to be here sharing our experiences. We in New York City, just like many of you around the country have been living in an unprecedented time of uncertainty and pandemic. We've seen significant changes in our clinical environment, patient presentations, and how we practice medicine occurring daily, even hour by hour, requiring fluidity and flexibility like never before. We've seen our large convention center transformed into a hospital, a U.S. Navy hospital ship dock in Manhattan, field hospitals being planned and implemented in parks and sports fields, and tents erected outside of a majority of emergency departments. We are witnessing an unparalleled number of deaths and critically ill patients stretching and challenging our emergency departments, hospitals, and health systems. But most importantly, we've seen remarkable acts of kindness that in my opinion have been spreading far more quickly than the virus. New Yorkers cheering frontline workers nightly at 7 p.m., countless donations of food deliveries and PPE, redeployed staff and physicians coming to the ED and working in ways they haven't in years and maybe ever. And our own amazing emergency department staff and physicians coming together, rising up and demonstrating courage, grit, and resilience, doing what they do 24-7, 365, with such dignity and grace. Wow, truly unprecedented times indeed. Thank you, Dr. Mills. And Dr. Sharma, welcome again. Please tell us why it's important for your teams in New York City to share their experiences with the rest of the country. Certainly, Dr. Martin, thank you very much. It is extremely important for us to share what has happened in New York City with the rest of the country. As many of you are aware, New York City is currently the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak in the United States. Specifically, the borough of Queens has become the epicenter of the epicenter. We believe that it's, it is important for us at NYP, Wild Cornell, and Columbia to share our experiences, challenges, and innovations over the last month. What we discussed this evening will not only inform future workflows and planning for all emergency departments, but will change the way emergency physicians approach and address future crises. These last few weeks have challenged all of us as leaders and as frontline staff. We've had to shift our perspective and revise our traditional approaches to emergency care. Also, it has never been more crucial to have a standardized approach across our health system. 
The commitment and camaraderie of our leadership teams across the system were integral to achieving this uniformity. Tonight, you will hear from our outstanding teams across our health system about the efforts in operations, quality, innovation, and faculty affairs. I would like to thank SAM for giving us this platform to share our experience. Great points, Dr. Sharma. Well, thank you both for your time, for your leadership, and for your willingness to share your knowledge with our audience. I now want to introduce our speakers for this evening. Dr. Nicholas Gavin, Vice Chair of Clinical Operations at Columbia University. Dr. Peter Steele, Director of Clinical Services at Weill Cornell Medicine. Dr. Marie Lohr Romney, Vice Chair of Quality and Patient Safety at Columbia University. Dr. Brenna Farmer, Site Director at New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital Emergency Department. Dr. Peter Greenwald, Director of Emergency Medicine Telehealth Services at Weill Cornell Medicine. Dr. Erica Olson, Director of Virtual Health Services at Columbia University. Dr. Matthew McCarty, Director of Quality Assurance, Weill Cornell Medicine and Dr. Manish Sharma, Chair of Emergency Medicine, New York Presbyterian Queens. We also have several experts with us online to answer questions as needed. Dr. Gavin, I wanna turn this over to you at this point. Thank you, Dr. Martin. We're proud to be here tonight to share our experience over the last few weeks with the COVID-19 pandemic. Our agenda tonight is to speak to you about how we've shifted our day-to-day -day operations, and to speak in some detail about our evidence and experience-based care pathways. Then we'll turn to our telehealth innovations that have enormously supported what, we, what we've been doing on the ground. And finally, we'll speak about the impact on faculty affairs within our departments. First, a few caveats. We are not disaster preparedness experts. We're operations and quality leaders in academic emergency departments. What we'll share tonight is our experience and our approach which has been informed whenever possible by experts in the field of disaster preparedness. What we've found over the last few weeks is that we must be prepared to fail fast and to fail forward. Every day brings new challenges and the need for new innovations. We do not have all the answers, nor has our response been anywhere near perfect. We hope that by sharing our experience tonight, we can inform preparedness efforts across the country so as to make this whole experience even just a little bit easier for our SAM community. With that said, let's dive into the impact this pandemic has had on our operations. First, you should know that we have not, generally speaking, seen a huge surge in patient volume presenting to our EDs on a daily basis. Early on, we saw an uptick in volume as patients with mild Ill illness were presenting with the expectation of testing. Our health system took a critical strategy early on, only testing patients with severe disease that required admission with rare exceptions for vulnerable populations. As time has gone on and acuity has soared, low acuity volume has diminished at all of our sites. Of particular note, pediatric volume, even in our standalone children's hospital has plummeted. Yesterday in our children's hospital, which typically sees 140 patients per day, we saw 23 patients. Our health system of 10 hospitals has consolidated pediatric care to one location and operations in all of our EDs has largely been unaffected by that move. This has led to creative thinking about internal redeployment of pediatric emergency physicians and use of pediatric care space for adult patients. More on that in a minute. With all that said, here's a visual schematic of our preparation paradigm. From left to right, there's pent up community demand for acute care and emergency care. So much of that demand we've found can be met by telehealth strategies within emergency medicine and also within ambulatory care networks. For those who make it to our doors, we've deployed strategies to divert low acuity volume into an expanded ED footprint inside of tents and other innovative care spaces. Additionally, we've put in care models, which we'll speak about in a minute, to divert to other outpatient locations. Once patients hit the ED, we have internal pressure mitigation strategies, which we'll speak about in some detail, namely redeployment of external resources into the ED space, use of alternate care space, particularly for boarding patients, 
and expansion of ICU capacity, which is probably the most important thing you should be doing right now and advocating for within your hospitals if you're beginning to see just a slow trickle of patients. Three strategies we've deployed to relieve pressure on the ED are one, increased efficiency of ancillary services. In particular, come up with a strategy in advance on obtaining portable chest x-rays. Demand for these will skyrocket when your community is hit. Number two, increased efficiency of consults. Surgical services are offloaded given the cancellation of many, many elective procedures. Agree to written standards on early consultation and farm out procedural work to non-EM colleagues whenever possible. Third, for patients who manage to make it to the ED but can be safely managed in an outpatient setting, we've utilized a strategy of performing a medical screening exam and ensuring safe transition to an outpatient setting. More on that in a minute. We'll now dive into the specifics of pressure mitigation strategies. First, our tents. At our hospitals, we use strategies that were tailored to each population and specific to each situation. At our safety net hospitals, we leveraged tent space for low acuity care and expanded the footprint of our EDs. When possible, consider leveraging outpatient care providers to staff these facilities. This will enable EM providers to focus on the growing wave of critical care and sicker patients. We created a standardized triage process at all campuses to ensure safe transition from the triage desk to the tent and from the tent to the ED when necessary. One important note is that we've been pushing public messaging that we're not performing testing in the tent, again, with the goal of avoiding low acuity volume. Some of our locations have also used tents for lower acuity non-infectious illness care. Another strategy we've deployed is to rapidly see low acuity patients and move them to alternate locations in the outpatient setting. We've primarily deployed a two encounter strategy for a number of reasons. Essentially the patient arrives with a problem that we would typically provide comprehensive care for, for instance, an ankle sprain where we're worried about a fracture. These patients are seen by an emergency physician or, or mid-level provider. We hear the history, check the pulse in their foot, communicate with the clinic and discharge the patient to their care. This has required a frame shift in our mindset but has freed up significant capacity of emergency physicians and emergency advanced practice providers as our critical care needs have grown. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Peter Steele, Director of Clinical Services at Weill Cornell Emergency Medicine to speak about what we've been doing inside our EDs. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, given uh, the COVID-19 crisis, um, there really is an opportunity to look through a different lens at emergency medicine. Um, and really view our department no longer as an emergency medicine department, but as a disaster medicine department. And in a department of disaster medicine, there's never more need for daily huddles. And in our case, we invited infectious diseases and sometimes the ethics team down, um, palliative services down to lead huddles in our department. And there's never more of a time for leadership rounding, daily leadership rounding throughout the day, evening and night to reassure staff, answer questions, and be visible in the face of this disaster. Given the paradigm shift from emergency medicine to disaster medicine, there is an opportunity to redesign our department into a disaster department. And I'm gonna talk about the three main sections of a disaster department. The first is the contaminated unit, where the majority of COVID patients will be evaluated, managed, and maybe boarding, waiting for a bed upstairs. If your department is large enough, you may have multiple contaminated units as we have had an IC unit, unit, a stable unit, and a treat and release unit. Three units where COVID patients can be managed and evaluated. In the ICU unit, this is a perfect opportunity early on in your COVID crisis to engage both ICU and anesthesia leadership to have an equal say in how you design this area. PARS should be appropriate for RSI medications and ventilators. And my colleague, Marie Romney, will talk about that in more detail. Other critical care resources should be brought down to make the ICU unit as complete as possible. The stable and treat and release units, similarly, you wanna turn off positive pressure. You want to retrofit the rooms if possible with telephones or telemedicine devices 
so that staff can communicate with patients without necessarily going into the room and incurring unnecessary communicable disease risk. There's also an opportunity to look at each area and decide which rooms are perfect for proning. And I would suggest those are the rooms with the highest visibility between patient and staff for safety purposes. We also worked closely with infectious disease to discuss room hierarchy. In your COVID areas, there should be a hierarchy of rooms, negative pressure being the top hierarchy. Second top is single occupancy doored rooms. Double occupancy doored rooms would be your third choice with a divider between the patients and both patients masked. Less desirable is a curtained room and least desirable is a hallway room. Patients should always be masked when in the least desirable rooms. The buffer unit, which geographically should be between the contaminated unit and the clean unit, should be where you triage potential infectious cases or undifferentiated cases such as weakness or malaise. Some of those may end up being COVID positive patients, um, but it, because it is not the clean unit, that is not a suboptimal triage. Geographically, as I said, it can be positioned between both the contaminated COVID unit and the clean non-COVID unit. And it can also allow for COVID overflow in times of surge. The sterile unit should be whenever possible, not somewhere where COVID patients are triaged. In order to develop the sterile unit, I strongly recommend engaging your notification teams. And by that, I mean your acute stroke team, your trauma team, and your acute MI team. This will make them key stakeholders right at the beginning of your department's transition to a disaster department. We would also advise selective triaging of obvious non-infectious problems and OBGYN problems. This should be as far away as possible from your contaminated unit as referenced in the diagram. In terms of staffing your department with emergency physicians, we took an approach of modest overstaffing for two main reasons. One is while your total volume is likely to go down, your acuity will go up. Not just patient acuity, but also the preparation need to see each patient, donning and doffing PPE. The second reason for overstaffing is to instill confidence in your team. This is a time where mainstream media is creating a hysteria and your staff may be in chat rooms sharing experiences in the clinical forum that may diminish the confidence in your team's leadership. You want provider teams to have a slow methodical approach to caring for these patients, not feeling rushed and chaotic like the mainstream media feels. So overstaffing will enable your team to come to work confident every day and not expend it at the end of each shift. The exception to the overstaffing model is likely to be pediatrics, where you may see such small volumes of patients that you wanna go lean in pediatrics and maybe even divert your pediatric EM staff into the adult ED. We had pediatric physicians seeing patients up to 35 years old. In terms of diverting other non-emergency physician staff to your emergency department, here's some solutions about which of those staff should work in which area. In terms of your contaminated unit, where you may be seeing high volumes of critically ill COVID patients, we would suggest if you're lucky enough to have intensivists or pulmonologists and hospitalists staff in your emergency department, they will be best suited to the contaminated unit and best suited to the ICU contaminated unit. The buffer unit offers opportunities for expertise of medicine fellows to evaluate patients in DKA with cellulitis with a UTI. Hospitalists will be well served there. We preferred medicine fellows because of their proximity to their general medicine training. In terms of the clean unit, this is an opportunity for the skill sets of surgeons, orthopedists, cardiologists, OBGYN and neurologists with the various stroke, trauma and acute MI cases to really flourish. Most important before those team members come down to serve in the ED is to make sure that they are appropriately orientated. 
And for two good reasons. One is you want your staff to be functional in the emergency department, but just as important is to reassure and instill confidence that their decision to volunteer in the ED is not gonna lead to chaos and poor care. So this is about branding your department's orientation as much as it is about the orientation itself. We suggest all of the new faculty go through your conventional department orientation. We suggest a separate COVID care orientation and would advise you invest heavily in IT. We have an online team site that's used as a repository for all COVID information for our general staff. This doubled as an orientation tool for new faculty. We suggest shadow shifts with frequent debriefing. We suggest their first shift should not be a solo shift, but a double swing shift with a debrief. And that these doubling of shifts working side by side with an ED physician should continue for about a week until the providers feel comfortable. We also suggest QAing their charts within that first week as an opportunity for more feedback. And then finally, when they're ready to fly solo, they should be, their first shift should be a swing shift. So I'm gonna hand over now to my colleague, Marie Nonni to discuss PPE. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to spend a little time talking about PPE. For those who aren't already dealing with the surge in patients, how you want to manage PPE is something you need to plan for to avoid confusion and angst among people working in your ED. At our institution, we worked very closely with hospital leadership and our infection control and prevention team to make decisions on when and how PPE would be used across the 11 EDs in the enterprise. We followed all the hospital recommended guidelines about PPE, which now include masking all patients who present to the ED with very few exceptions and all ED personnel wearing goggles and surgical masks throughout their shift and donning gowns when evaluating patients. I can't overstate the importance of developing a system for stocking and distribution of PPE. In our experience, as the volume and acuity of patients increased, so did the demand for PPE. We found that stocking every shift was not enough. So we have had, we've, deseg we've designated stockers who do PPE rounds every few hours to replenish supplies. It's also important to educate and remind everyone about what type of PPE is needed and when, especially regarding the use of N95 masks. When and how we use PPE evolved as the volume of patients with suspected COVID increased. We identified relatively early that the clinical presentation of this virus is quite broad and when community spread increased, patients presenting with completely unrelated complaints were still found to be COVID positive. As a result, we moved quickly to a strategy of masking almost all patients, unless someone was presenting with an isolated ankle fracture or laceration. I would also say, even more important than masking the patients, and of course, aggressive reminders about hand washing, was our decision to move to having all personnel in the ED wear masks and goggles throughout their shift. This was critical in reducing the number of team members quarantined or isolated due to exposure or illness. The hospital, the hospital facilitated this by providing all personnel working in all of our EDs reusable goggles that get cleaned between use. A few strategies for preserving PPE include early on, if possible, creating clean and dirty or PUI and non-PUI care spaces in your EDs, as Dr. Steele alluded to earlier. We also ask consultants who come down to the ED to limit the number of members of their team who go into the room to evaluate a PUI patient. One thing to consider in addition to, to traditional PPE is providing scrubs for personnel who work in the ED that can be used during shifts. While this has not been a formal recommendation in the management of COVID suspected patients, many of our providers have asked for this and we, with the support of the hospital, are in the process of operationalizing this now. We believe this will go a long way in providing psychological safety for those concerned about bringing this virus home to their families. You should emphasize that scrubs worn in the ED shouldn't be worn outside of the hospital. They should be placed in a paper bag and laundered as usual. Another important thing to plan for is training of all frontline staff in proper donning and doffing techniques, especially N95s, as self-contamination is a common source of infection and the risk is especially high when doffing N95 masks. Moving on to communication, there are so many moving parts and changes happening frequently as the volume of cases increase. We found a lot of success using one person as our main source of communication for everyone in our group. 
That person sends almost all emails related to COVID communication, including updates to hospital policies or clinical guidelines. While there are multiple different sources for the information being included in the emails, having them filter, filtered through one point person helps in letting everyone know where to go for this information. In addition to emails, all of our campuses have a variety of standing meetings and phone calls that occur throughout the week. The local ED leadership teams have a daily operations meeting to keep everyone up to date on changes related to personnel, internal and external ED operations and clinical guidelines. We also host multiple calls a week with the frontline to report out on changes and updates while also soliciting feedback on what's working or what needs, what's needed on the ground. At the enterprise level, we have a 9 p.m. call with senior leaders from NYP, as well as the ED leadership teams for both providers and nursing from all 11 hospitals. This serves as a place for information sharing about enterprise-wide updates, what each site is experiencing at their local ED, consensus building and alignment on clinical management strategies and many other things. We also have a team site where all communications live accessible by all who work in the ED. However others decide to structure this, the important thing is to communicate frequently and across all levels of your organization. Don't assume that those working on the front lines have the same information you're hearing from hospital leadership and make it a priority to get the feedback and insights from those who are caring for these patients every day. I'm going to hand this over now to Dr. Farmer who's going to talk to you about our clinical care pathways. Thank you, Dr. Romney. We're now gonna change gears and focus on our clinical pathway development and what it looks like now. These pathways were developed with representatives from each of the New York Presbyterian campuses. We started with standard conservative practice and had to adjust very quickly to developing our process around disaster management and thinking about which patients could go home if they had appropriate follow-up. These pathways do not fulfill all aspects of clinical management and do not take away clinical judgment. These pathways were reviewed with services caring for these patients, but they did not approve them prior to implementation. The approval process came through those 9 p.m. calls with ED leadership and hospital leadership. This first slide is the entire pathway for our full evaluation of COVID patients. It's a busy slide and we'll get into the details shortly. We split the, the suspected COVID-19 patients into three buckets, mild, moderate, and severe illness. Mild il illness focuses on patients who require the least resources. Severe illness was the easiest category to define as those patients come in critically ill and require ICU level of care right away. Our mild illness pathway is for the well-appearing patient essentially with normal vital signs. These patients do not have risk factors. These patients require the least amount of care in the emergency department, so we do not do any testing and no routine chest x-rays are done. The other evaluations are usually determined by clinical findings and we determine right away whether these patients should be admitted or discharged based on exertional hypoxia. Our exertional O2 saturation is focused at the bedside with a one minute walk in place. These patients, if they are not abnormal, if their O2 sat is not abnormal, so greater than 90% O2 saturation, they will go home with appropriate follow-up. And that was probably the most um, risky part of the pathway as we were developing it and as we were going into disaster mode. We'll talk about the discharge process in a few minutes. Our moderate illness pathway is, is the most detailed pathway. It focuses on patients with risk factors that you can see in your upper right hand corner and those patients coming in with abnormal vital signs including hypoxia rest less than 94% or tachypnea. Those patients get a full COVID evaluation which includes laboratory studies, a portable chest x-ray, and whatever clinical management you define necessary at the bedside. We avoid CT scans in these patients as we want to maintain our, the sterility of the radiology suite for other patients coming in. 
Our severe illness pathway, like I said, was the easiest pathway. Those patients that do not improve from the moderate pathway who continue to have hypoxia or who come in with acute respiratory distress get treated immediately with critical care and admitted to the hospital. None of these patients go home. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Manish Sharma from New York Presbyterian Queens to talk about our follow-up care, which is robust and necessary when we're sending home patients with exertional hypoxia. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. Um, upon the finalization of our pathway, we quickly realized and accepted that we would be sending uh, patients home who under normal circumstances would have been admitted. Um, we're classifying these patients, as Dr. Farmer said, as moderate risk COVID EV discharges. This population would be of a saturation between 90 to 94%. There's a subclassification of these two groups, uh, an exertional saturation that goes between 90 to 92. These patients receive an oxygen concentrator, usually set to two liters continuous nasal cannula and get a pulse oximeter upon discharge. This discharge occurs after six hours of observation in ER to make sure that they're doing well on the oxygen. The other group, the 93 to 94% on exertional saturation gets a pulse oximeter upon discharge. The exertional saturation is just one piece of the discharge and I wanna make it clear that the entire clinical picture is more important because what you will see is a lot of these patients look well and have low exertional stats. So the full clinical picture is by far the most important thing. The pulse oximeters and the oxygen concentrators, which you can imagine are very hard to acquire. Uh, the NYP enterprise uh, ha got a pool of them and they're distributed to each of the 11 sites and a PAR is kept to see which site based on volume and discharges within the different categories needs more. That count is kept up daily so that the appropriate site gets the appropriate equipment. Education. So education on the use of pulse oximeters and oxygen concentrators is done by the provider, nursing, case management team together, and they collaborate on an hourly basis due to shifts in volume and shifts in the types of patients who are coming in. We've also developed specialized instructions methods of tracking and education on what a patient should do if they need to escalate either before a follow-up visit or in between follow-up visits. And obviously being in New York City, we've made this educational material in many different languages. So we knew that the population we're sending home was very high risk under normal circumstances. So the importance of follow-up was by far the most important thing. That's why we leveraged not only the existing telehealth resources that we have, but used the relaxation of the guidelines about what we can use, modalities like Zoom, FaceTime, WhatsApp, which now are allowed in this pandemic. We initiate these telehealth visits prior to discharge with an order within the EMR to make sure that we do not miss patients once they leave. Uh, you can imagine that uh, while emergency medicine physicians are taking care of the emergency room patients, we obviously needed uh, to expand our capacity to follow up with patients. Um, we increased our resources within emergency medicine by reaching out to our colleagues from other various departments, educating them, training them on how to appropriately do these follow-ups. They've been outstanding teammates in helping us care for patients outside of the ED and doing things that they hadn't done in the past. These patients receive an initial moderate risk COVID follow-up within 12 to 16 hours of ED discharge, and they can receive up to four or five follow-ups within a 48-hour period. The, after the 48-hour period, period is over, we initiate continued follow-up after that initial moderate risk COVID follow-up. Of the hundreds of patients that we've discharged in this moderate risk COVID ED discharge group, the majority of the patients who've come back have been because of progression of their disease, which was expected. Uh, we'd like to show you now a educational video, a simulation of what this moderate risk COVID follow-up looks like.
Hi, my name is Neil Nag, and I'm one of the educators at the Center for Virtual Care. This video is an instructional video on how to do follow-up follow exams for respiratory distress. Hi, Dr. Stern. Uh, my name is Dr. Nayak. Uh, I'm calling from Weill Cornell uh, Medicine uh, just to do a quick follow-up because I understand that you were just discharged from the hospital uh, after coming in with some symptoms of uh, some fevers and cough and some shortness of breath. So the first thing I'd like you to do is just stand up and walk right around your chair there, uh, just a few steps and then sit back down. Okay. And how do you feel after just doing that? A little winded. Okay. And how are you feeling now? I'm pretty winded. Okay. Uh, I'd like to check how fast you're breathing now again. Uh, okay. So again, if you could just put your hand on your chest. I'm feeling a little dizzy. Okay. Okay, it does look like your, your breathing is actually significantly faster. And I can see how uh, visibly, how short a breath you are, just even with that little exertion. Hi, my now I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Marie Laura Romney, who's going to be talking about the critical care aspects of care in the emergency department. Thank you, Manish. To pivot back to the third arm of the clinical pathway that Dr. Farmer spoke about earlier, for critical care management, we're mostly synthesizing existing recommendations on the management of shock respiratory failure, and ARDS. However, I'd like to highlight a few specific recommendations related to airway management and CPR. First, in patients presenting with acute respiratory distress, you should have a very low threshold for intubating patients suspected of having COVID-19. The use of non-invasive ventilation in the management of these patients has been discouraged both because of the increased risk of spread of infection through aerosolization, but also because COVID patients with a good chance of recovery seem to do better with early intubation. When the decision is made to intubate a patient, the procedure should be done in a negative pressure room and everyone in the room should have full PPE, including N95 masks for airborne precautions. Intubation is an aerosol generating procedure and is considered particularly high risk in these patients. If feasible, you should move to a model that includes an airway response team. This may be controversial, but what worked for our institution was a shared model with anesthesia, whereby anesthesia responds to all intubations in the ED, and at some sites, there's a dedicated COVID airway team stationed in the ED. This was done to ensure our staff, our staff is protected as much as possible. This has also been critical in addressing the rapidly increasing number of intubations in the ED. In addition to the PPE requirements I just talked about, our anesthesia and ED teams created a COVID airway bag that is stocked in all the EDs and brought down by anesthesia for every airway. That bag includes, among other things, N95 masks, welder's masks, a HEPA filter to be attached to the AMBU bag, and a dedicated McGrath laryngoscope. The intubation should be done using RSI technique, including avoidance of BVM ventilation. Whenever possible, avoid direct laryngoscopy and try to use a and try to use video laryngoscopy. For CPR, it's critical to remind everyone that proper PPE is essential, even if it slightly delays resuscitation. All personnel in the room must observe airborne, droplet, and contact precautions using fluid resistant gowns. Only those with an identified role should enter the room. If feasible, designate someone to be a runner and PPE observer. That person should stand outside the resuscitation room and provide crowd control, ensure proper PPE is distributed to those who are entering the room and facilitate communication between the resuscitation team and those charged with getting supplies. The code cart should remain outside the room. If possible, intubation should be deferred until after ROSC and for airway management, an LMA or supraglottic airway with HEPA filter should be used. To minimize aerosolization, these can be connected to a vent to create a more closed loop system. 
If immediate intubation is necessary for airway obstruction, for example, pause chest compressions during intubation until the ET tube cuff is inflated and the tube is secured and ideally connected to the vent. Finally, to avoid interruptions in CPR and to minimize the number of people needed in the resuscitation room, consider using a Lucas system if available. I'm going to hand off now to Dr. Greenwald to talk about the use of telemedicine during this pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Romney. In order to put the telemedicine response uh, into perspective, let me talk first about where our institution was before the coronavirus came to New York. Back in 2016, next slide please. Back in 2016, New York Presbyterian made a major commitment to expand telemedicine services. Our EDs were early adopters in that effort. Uh, we developed a, a fleet of ED service lines including uh, an express care service line where we see patients in our EDs with telemedicine, a telemedicine staffed provider in triage model, a sitter program using telemedicine, an at-home program for patients with congestive heart failure where our ED docs partner by telemedicine with our paramedics to treat patients uh, in their homes in the same way we would in the emergency department. Uh, med reconciliation happening with pharmacists coming in by telemedicine to the emergency department, and also an urgent care service line, a direct to consumer telemedicine service line. Uh, Dr. Olson will talk in a few minutes about uh, how we've used telemedicine within our institutions uh, to fight uh, this pandemic. But let me talk a little bit specifically about the urgent care telemedicine program. Almost overnight, we had a 10 to 15 fold increase in, in volume on this program. And as our hospitals uh, fill, it's essential that we safely keep people at home who, who can be at home, who have mild illness. We're all in various degrees worried uh, about this virus and it can certainly make many people horribly ill, but I'm impressed by how many people have mild symptoms at home and we need ways to get them information and keep them home so they don't come into the emergency department. And we're treating many hundreds of patients a day in that category. To meet this increased volume though, we needed to bring additional providers into the system. We couldn't staff this with ED providers. Those ED providers need to be elsewhere. Um, and many of these providers were new to telemedicine and also not acute care providers. We need to rapidly scale up our education systems to bring these providers on board. Using our telemedicine experience and this infusion of new providers, we've been able to not only staff things like the post-discharge program that uh, Dr. Sharma was talking about before, but have also started to do some innovative things like using telemedicine to help unburden our 911 system. Uh, we have now have 911 calls diverted into our telemedicine pathways. Next slide. So to rapidly train these providers into this platform, as well as train providers across the institution how to do telemedicine better, we rapidly changed uh, the type of education our Center for Virtual Care, our, our hub for telemedicine training was doing. At the Wild Cornell Center for Virtual Care, we'd, we'd had a small group simulation-based learning model, but that didn't scale adequately. So we rapidly transitioned to online modules and training videos like the one you saw clips from before. Um, I'll now, now hand over to Dr. Olson to talk a little bit about how we've used these same telemedicine tools in the ED. Uh, thank you, Dr. Greenwald. Um, good evening. So as COVID-19 started to um, unfold, we started to develop constraints within our department. And we sat back and thought, how could we leverage the uh, current telehealth capabilities that we have um, to alleviate some of the pressures that we were feeling? And namely, our, our key constraints were our people, 
um, our workforce that was going out on quarantine, um, our PPE, which is something everyone is experiencing, our physical space where we really wanted to reduce the, uh, the foot traffic, um, and then our patient needs, which were changing very rapidly. And so my goal tonight is just to share with you some of the ideas that we used. Um, and if you need more detail on any of these models, I'm happy to answer those questions. This is more of an overview. So regarding our people, especially in the beginning phases, uh, phase, we had several providers who were exposed to COVID-19 unknowingly and then had to go out on quarantine, but they were feeling well, um, but they still needed to be off the floor. And so one of our strategies was to redeploy those people um, into our virtual programs. And so one of the first things we did was to utilize our express care model so that the virtual attending could supervise cases with the in-person physician assistant on the ground. And they essentially would see their own stream of patients and for every patient that they took, they would also place another patient in front of the, into the virtual pathway. That virtual attending had the ability to have a full conversation with the patient. Um, and at that point, especially in the beginning, a history was very critical regarding travel and contacts and essentially um, educate the patient on their discharge. This was utilized, I should say, for very low risk patients. Um, and then the uh, on the ground examination was completed by the physician assistant and the patient could go home. Um, we then extended this program into the waiting room and created an, a nurse free model whereby we could function as providers collectively without our nursing staff. A patient would uh, take a number, walk up to a, almost a self serve device. Um, and a similar process ensued. Uh, there's a picture on the next slide I'll get to in a minute. Regarding PPE, we placed carts into the isolation rooms and this was effective, especially in the beginning when patients were presenting with more mild disease. Um, and basically rather than having to don and off PPE, the providers could um, simply talk to them over the screen. Uh, it cut down on the number of times that, the, that they had to enter the patient room and expose themselves. Um, in terms of our physical space, our, um, all of our consultants in the institution have been made virtual capable so they can hold all of their consultations virtually. We have a dedicated um, device at the CAT scanner for um, stroke evaluation. And now we're actually starting to shift into other, other consultations such as palliative care. And we're even starting to talk about perhaps having patient family members be able to utilize this to see their loved ones um, when they can't be physically present in the, in the hospital. Lastly, uh, I just want to address our patient needs. They were changing by the minute on um, the initial wave compared to now and compared to what it will look like over the next few weeks. Um, so I want to mention two things. Number one, it was certainly very helpful that we had telehealth in place. The uh, slide that Dr. Greenwald showed, showed you with our suite of services, it was all there and ready to go. And so um, I would say that having telehealth in some way, shape or form in your department is definitely useful so that you're not trying to learn new technology in the midst of a crisis. And um, lastly, I just want to say the power, one of the power, uh, powerful parts of telehealth is that it's so flexible. You can build it and break it down within an hour you can flex up into it. So for example, our no nurse model, we would turn it on for a few hours and then turn it off once things had decompressed. And so it gives you tremendous flexibility. So I just wanna wish everyone well um, in facing this. And I think if you focus on what are the actual constraints in your department and design the telehealth strategies to target those, um, that's the best approach. Thank you. I'm going to now turn over to Dr. McCarthy, who's going to talk about faculty affairs and there's the nurse free model. 
Thank you, Dr. Olson, and good evening. So the first topic I'm going to talk about is at-risk faculty and the importance of peer support. So one of the things to be considering now before you are seeing the surge of COVID patients is to develop an at-risk provider plan. Different institutions have defined the at-risk provider in different ways, whether that is an age cutoff, medical comorbidities, pregnant women, people with newborns at home. But this criteria obviously needs to be vetted for your HR department and through hospital leadership, as it will apply probably throughout the institution. Wellness is one of our primary focuses here at Cornell and throughout the Presbyterian system, and we have attendings dedicated to our wellness. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were holding bi-monthly doc boxes where attendings could get together in a more casual setting, talk about issues that were affecting them. We've moved these to a weekly event now in a virtual platform with a loose agenda, really allowing our attendings to bring up issues and talk through problems in a setting that isn't full of operational or clinical updates. One of the things you need to worry about now is identifying emotional support opportunities. Working these long 12 hour shifts in PPE in high acuity settings with really sick patients is going to be a drain on your attendings emotionally and on the rest of your staff in the emergency department. There's going to be a large pool of outpatient psychiatric and emotional support resources that have become available as their outpatient clinics and practices have closed. We had multiple psychologists avail themselves to our department and offered to provide both free one-on-one -on -one personal counseling and group sessions on stress management and the emotional response to this. And our attendings have found that really valuable, but now would be the time to look for these in your own community. Additionally, this sounds pretty simple, but it really has an impact is to feed your staff. The medical college here is offered to free our staff seven days a week, both at lunch and dinner. And it really takes a burden off providers who are working 12 hours of little opportunity for break when they know that they're gonna have lunch and dinner and not have to worry about eating, going grocery shopping and cooking when they get home. Additionally, you should embrace offers to support your faculty in everyday life. We've had medical scribes here and our medical students reach out about helping our providers with laundry, babysitting and other everyday needs, lessening one other worry um, outside of the COVID pandemic. So the next thing I'm gonna discuss is your return to work for both COVID positives, physicians, advanced practice providers, and residents. One thing that you should expect to happen and be prepared for is that initially your occupational health service or your workforce health and safety department will be overwhelmed. We had one of our internal administrative assistants perform internal tracking of which providers were out, when they were due back, and who we should follow up with. Obviously, this has some HIPAA issues, um, but you need to come up with a system to track on your own. As was discussed during the PPE section of the call, please ensure that you're protecting your faculty now. We found a dramatic decrease in our exposed faculty and faculty members getting sick when we mandated, no matter where they were in the emergency department, wearing eye protection and a surgical mask. Additionally, you should be masking all your patients regardless of chief complaint now, and this will dramatically reduce exposures. I'm going to preface any discussion of when providers can return to work by saying you need to follow your state Department of Health guidance. Please expect this guidance to change rapidly, and you need a dedicated person to be following this closely so you know when your providers can return. Just to give you an example of what the New York State current guidance is, we no longer are quarantining faculty for high-risk exposures without symptoms. It's important that your providers, both the attending and residents, are checking their temperature twice a day and monitoring closely for symptoms. If they were developed symptoms, the current New York State guidance is that they are quarantined for seven days. And if after seven days, they've had no fever for 72 hours, their symptoms have improved, they can return and work as long as they're wearing a surgical mask at all times. And like was discussed in the telemedicine talk, it is important, many of our providers who've gotten taken out either symptomatically or are on quarantine have been able to perform alternative roles, including telemedicine. So you should have a program in place to rapidly onboard these providers in your telemedicine platform. I believe it also helps them feel that they're still assisting the department when they can no longer be working clinically. Thank you. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Gavin for closing. Thank you, Matt. Before we begin our question and answer session, we'd like to make a few acknowledgements. First, thank you to SAM for managing to pull this off. Peter Steele and I came to the team with this idea one week ago and they managed to create this incredible event. It's a very special organization that I'm incredibly proud to be a part of. 
Second, thanks to our chairs and all of the chairs across New York Presbyterian who have been phenomenally supportive of us through this incredibly difficult time. Third, thanks to Dr. Kate Halpern, former SAM president who's been steering our emergency medicine ship at New York Presbyterian. Finally, and most importantly, thanks to the frontline faculty, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, residents, nurses, EMTs, paramedics, and every other essential, essential personnel in our departments whose feedback led to all of these actions. We are so grateful to be a part of phenomenal teams who are right now putting their lives on the line. And it is our work, their work, that we highlight tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gavin. And thank you again to all our speakers for this timely and insightful presentation. In a few moments, we will answer questions from the audience. As a reminder, for those who are attending the live session, please send your questions in via the Q&A pop-up window by clicking the Q&A button in your Zoom menu interface. We will get to as many questions as time will permit. Uh, we have about uh, 60 minutes left. So while the questions are coming in, I'd like to get us started with an initial question to Drs. Mills and Sharma. One of the things that makes your response even more challenging is that you're an academic uh, medical center. I'd love to hear how uh, this pandemic has impacted your education and research missions. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Martin. So being an academic medical center with a shared residency program and residencies across our healthcare system, we wanted to make sure that our education wasn't compromised. So we've actually gone to a Zoom model of uh, weekly conferences, uh, a flipped classroom, uh, classroom model, uh, where we break it up between senior residents and junior residents. We've also had external speakers via Zoom to speak on uh, various inspirational talks as well as ethical talks. And our program director and residency leadership every Sunday night have a Zoom meeting with all the residents. So, while they might not be able to be together physically, we want we are definitely making sure that they're connected from an education standpoint. Fantastic. A Angela? Yeah, thank you. Um, regarding our research mission, uh, our schools have instituted a, man a mandated research pause. And so investigators have had to ramp down much of their research. So, so not to expose our research staff, we've tried to be creative about working remotely, completing tasks, cleaning data sets, administrative work, um, and exploring teleconsent and other infrastructure for our research staff to support our investigators. We've really been refocusing our energy on COVID-specific research, including looking into funding opportunities for supplements on our federal grants, and looking at the intersection of how the ED can lead and also collaborate on COVID research. We've also been working to publish our academic scholarly work on some of the clinical initiatives that you heard about tonight. And this has also sparked many new collaborations with other departments and colleagues. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for, uh, for those answers. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience now. And it looks like there are plenty that are coming in. Uh, our first question for the evening comes from Matthew Gratton. And this question is for Dr. Mills as well. How uh, have you actually reached the point of rationing ventilators or any other critical care devices? And if so, what me mechanism are you using? We've been uh, very lucky uh, with New York Presbyterian. We have a large health system with, the, uh, with all of the hospitals. And the um, hospital has not only acquired many more ventilators, um, we've been maybe like many of your hospitals and using our anesthesia machines as well as ventilators. So uh, we have not come to that, uh, that stage yet, um, but um, looking at sort of trajectories and, and ways that, that things are moving, um, the hospital has also been very proactive at looking for options for field hospitals and areas to be able to stand up very quickly um, almost like a mass unit type hospital setting where we could maybe accommodate uh, say 250 patients that would potentially be floor level. And then again, be able to, as you heard tonight, um, really up uh, our ICU level of, uh, of beds. Um, we're looking at pretty much tripling our ICU beds across our, our health system. And that's already uh, in place now and with lots of areas being converted to ICUs. Dr. Sharma, has it been the same thing for you at uh, Wild Cornell campus? Yeah, so we, we have expanded our ICU capability 
um, significantly by in the next few days, uh, we're going to add hundreds of ICU beds. Um, our PACUs are going to be converted into ICU areas. Um, we're also our pediatric ICU uh, is now an adult ICU. Um, and in terms of ventilators, we do we are okay right now, but our hospital leadership is working with both the state as well as federal uh, the federal government to get us more ventilators uh, uh, as the time as the days progress. Fantastic. So our next question, um, and this speaks to the global reach of our society, it comes from Brazil from Rodrigo Merlos, who asked, um, I would like to ask if any uh, in your practice have seen patients with significant desaturations without signs of respiratory distress, because in Brazil, he's seeing that happen often. So what, what are the parameters you're using for in, uh, indicating that invasive ventilatory support is needed? And that's for Dr. Farmer. Uh, perfect, I wasn't sure. Uh, we have seen a lot of patients that have had hypoxemia um, and low oxygen saturations when they come in and they look actually pretty comfortable. Um, so we're using other methods to assess for respiratory distress, like work of breathing, response to treatment, such as nasal cannula with non-rebreathers, or use of even high flow oxygen. We're not rushing to intubate all these patients. Uh, we have been doing across some of our EDs um, experiments with patient positioning, such as proning patients and turning them from side to side to see if we can get recruitment of those airways and the more lung mechanism to improve their saturations. And to be honest, we have had some success in um, getting these patients through this initial hypoxemia with just those methods. However, the cases where patients are having increased work of breathing and respiratory distress and that do not respond to those measures, they do go on to be intubated uh, and in those cases, there is thought that with the work of breathing, that that should be one of the things that you use to guide your management and not delay intubation in those patients. So what are some of the theories out there with these patients that I've heard folks refer to as happy hypoxics who have this profound level of desaturation but seem comfortable from uh, their clinical exam? What are some of the theories around that? This is open to our panel. Dr. Farmer, would you like to take that one? I don't know that I've looked at the pathophysiology to understand it completely. Um, it is a very unique uh, clinical presentation when these patients come in, but I could not explain the pathophysiology right now. I know I've heard some theories about perhaps the virus is inducing some sort of hemoglobinopathy uh, that may explain uh, this, this sort of almost uncoupling of the profound, the, the sign that you're seeing in terms of saturation, but you have a normal heart rate, you have a normal blood pressure, and their work or breathing appears to be normal. So it will be interesting to see what the final pathophysiology is around the virus. Thank it, you for it is very interesting. And there are folks that are looking at it from the hemoglobinopathy standpoint. And as a toxicologist, um, they're asking if it's related to either like a met hemoglobinemia um, or a um, carboxy uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. However, these patients tend to like oxygen and they don't have the um, same kind of uh, response or need other therapies right away um, or other antidotes. Um, but it is a theory. And I, I think there's a lot of our critical care colleagues that are looking at this to see how we can approach it and improve their care. Fantastic. Thank you. So this next question uh, comes from Glenn Hamilton and it's for Dr. Steele. Have you seen a shift in symptoms in patients testing positive over time? Have better criteria for predicting course of illness, especially leading to intubation, evolved with experience? Yes, I think that um, our experience as an institution has certainly evolved. I think we went from a paradigm of intubating early uh, to being much more confident with non-invasive measures initially. Um, spending time, as my colleagues have described, oxygenating initially with a nasal cannula, then a non-rebreather, then nasal cannula and a non-rebreather, then consideration for 
high flow O2 or even positive pressure ventilation in a negative pressure room before intubating. Um, the, the volume of crash intubations is about 10%, just to ballpark the numbers here. In terms of predicting, and I've been reading the questions online as this conversation has evolved over the past hour, um, folk have also been asking, are we using laboratory results uh, to predict who to discharge and, 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 and uh, who to admit? Um, the direct answer to that is no, not currently. But what we are learning in conversations with our ICU colleagues is that that um, cytokine storm that's happening around day seven to day 10, which is usually accompanied by progression to ARDS. Um, the harbinger of that cytokine storm is often a positive D-dimer as well as increased IL-6. And certainly as a group, uh, as we regroup next week uh, to talk about how our moderate risk discharge project is going, top of the agenda is are there better ways that we can risk stratify patients? And as a team, we will be thinking about drawing labs on some of those patients. As uh, Dr. Farmer and Dr. Sharma outlined, our highest risk discharge patients, those with SATs between 90 and 92, we're observing for a good few hours in the ED before we make that final commitment to discharge. During that observation time, we may explore drawing labs to risk stratify. But again, that will be in partnership with both our pulmonologists and our ICU attendings so that what we're doing as an emergency department or as a series of disaster departments um, is complementary and reflect reflective of what our inpatient services are doing and what our ICUs are doing also. If I, if I could just add to that, one thing we learned for sure is that we cannot predict who does not have the disease. As a system, we saw the disease in someone with appendicitis, someone who broke their neck when they fell, uh, someone who was admitted to the ICU with urosepsis and like urine culture proven positive, blood cultures positive. So if I could impress one thing upon everybody out there, if you're seeing community spread, everyone needs to be in proper PPE for every uh, patient encounter in the emergency department, period, full stop. We cannot predict who does not have the disease once there's community spread. And to add to that, everyone, ev the patients coming in need to be in a mask to help protect your staff. Excellent points, Drs. Farmer and, and Gavin. Yeah, the, um, maybe just one other thing to add to that. Is, is coaching and supporting your triage team. I think historically triage teams felt rewarded for being right, um, for being specific, not sensitive. You absolutely want to encourage your triage team in partnership with nursing leadership uh, to be uh, sen sensitive, but not specific. They should be casting their net very wide. Hence the reason for the buffer zone. That's where the lightheadedness goes. That's where the dizziness goes, because it may well be COVID. Ian, I'd like to at um, the most challenging times where we were having staff exposure was on the upswing of the disease where 30 to 40 percent of your patients were possibly COVID symptoms. The majority of us are seeing 90 percent COVID, treating everyone like COVID until proven otherwise. So it's far easier and we've seen far less staff exposures. So just a lesson for others, when you see the number of cases rising, whatever you want to put it at, like, you know, 30 percent of your cases, you should probably start treating everyone like a COVID at that point, instead of waiting till it's 65, 70% of your patients. The other, thing, the other thing I would add to that is, it's also really critical for you to protect your staff with the goggles and the masks, because even when you mask patients when they arrive, they take their mask down, you don't know when they're gonna cough, you're not, you didn't know that that was what they were presenting with, and then just like that, someone's getting sick. So as early as possible to protect your group by them wearing their own PPE, the better off you'll be. Thank you all. Well, let's move on to the next question. This comes from Damien Zild, and it's for Dr. Steele as well. But I, I, after Dr. Steele has an opportunity to respond, I'd love to open it up to the rest of the panels, because this is a theme uh, in terms of questions uh, uh, that we've seen uh, so far. So the question is about, have you placed patients in the prone position instead of intubating? And if so, if you could tell us a little bit about, about your experience there. Uh, well, thank you for offering the question to me, but I would really like uh, my colleagues Amos Shemesh um, and Brenna Farmer, uh, as well as Manish Sharma, to talk about that because um, we actually have a team for all of these problems and all of the 
potential solutions. We have subgroups that are working on this, coming to a consensus across our campuses. So please, Dr. Shamesh, Farmer, and Sharma, please, please feel free to answer that question. Thank you, Dr. Steele. So we've been working, this is our next guideline that we're actually mm -hmm. going to talk about on our 9 p.m. call tomorrow night is uh, patient positioning in the emergency department. And we're focusing on those moderate illness cases in patients that are awake, require oxygen therapy of some type, are able to rescue themselves. So they're not critically ill enough to where they're, they don't have the ability to turn over and get onto their side or back onto their back and that they can be in a, a stretcher where they can be visible and on continuous O2 SAP monitoring. Our, con our plan around the safety of these uh, cases is to make sure that the patient understands why we're asking them to change positions every 30 minutes and why we want to be able to monitor their oxygen saturation as well as their work of breathing. So we're building in different guidelines for our nurses and our um, physicians and non-physician providers to check on these patients to make sure that they improve. Uh, Manish has seen quite an improvement in several of his patients in Queens, and I'd like him to talk about that. Yeah, a lot. Most of the research has been done about uh, pronate, proning these patients and getting pronate, pronation plus to, plus an upright position has been done on intubated patients. Um, it's just about recruiting different parts of your lung that are not undergoing atelectasis and inflammatory process. Because when you look at the x-rays, it's usually perihilar, it's lower lung lobes. So the posterior lobes are not being affected as much. So it, being an academic site, there's a lot of thinkers and people started extrapolating the study about intubated patients into awake patients. And most of what we're seeing is with the right patient population, obviously being watched very closely, a non-rebreather will raise you, you know, an appropriate amount, not as much as you think in these patients. So you might have somebody who's satting 65% go up to 75 on a non-rebreather, and in the prone position, in the prone position, go up another five to 10%. So the theory, obviously, being using the parts of your lungs that usually aren't being used when you're sitting or lying flat. If I could, if I could add just one uh, piece of advice. If you are going to be doing this, uh, please make sure your nursing colleagues are aware. Uh, this freaked our nurses out in the ED, um, that they were putting people in prone for a few hours. They weren't used to it. They were not intubated. Um, you know, I think a lot of us were questioning if it actually works. Um, but that is the part that we found the hardest to deal with is because it is resource intensive. The nurse actually needs to really follow up with the patient, make sure the patient's doing well. And if you don't have a dedicated team in the ED and these admitted patients, the team's upstairs, that could result in some angst amongst your staff. Yeah. The other thing I want to ask, good for the patient who's permissive hypoxia, who's comfortable with that saturation. This is not for the patient who's already in respiratory distress and pending intubation, unless it's a temporary measure to get ready for the intubation. The, the visuals here are key. Um, having a patient prone, particularly anybody anywhere close to obese, uh, they can fall off the bed, they can, you can do the opposite, they can become hypoxic. So in the same way you want to prioritize the sickest of the sick who are going to be intubated to negative pressure rooms, you also want to think of the visuals. You want to be able to see these proning patients. They should not be tucked in the way in the corner of the ED. Glass doors, clear visibility for your nurses, at least, if not your nurses and providers. Dr. Farmer, in, in, in um, the proning of these patients, uh, have you all been using OptiFlow at all? Got a couple questions around that. So on my campus, we don't have OptiFlow as an option. We, um, it is used in the ICU and on some of the step down areas, but it's more limited access to us. So we're using a lot of nasal cannula with non rebreather. Um, okay. On some of our other campuses, they are using high flow oxygen and being able to see improvement in these, these patients. Um, the caveat being is a lot of our airway colleagues recommend putting a um, non-rebreather mask over it, even if there's no oxygen flowing to decrease the amount of aerosolization of droplets that can happen with that high flow being right on the nasal mucosa. Very good. Well, let's go on to our next question. Um, this is a question related to learners. And uh, the question comes from Michael Johnston. And this is, uh, 
uh, I will open this to the entire panel so as to give Dr. Steele a break here. Uh, how are you handling house staff involvement in patients under investigation? And who's performing the intubations at your various uh, sites? I'm happy to talk about that. Um, the intubations initially at New York Presbyterian in Queens were being performed by the most experienced ED provider uh, that quickly changed to anesthesia only. Shared risk, shared decision-making, and everybody in the hospital owning the patient, not just the M. Um, the residents were not intubating. Um, it was not safe for them to, and if, rarely are they, I won't say never, rarely are they the most experienced intubator. Okay, any others? Um, this is Rahul Sharma. So, you know, when initially um, COVID started, there was a lot of uh, questions if residents should be really participating in taking care of these patients, you know, and, and, and the, AA, the AAC endless serve as well. But we cl uh, quickly found out that given the volume and the acuity of patients, we had to have our residents involved in these patients. Uh, so our residents are taking care of COVID patients. However, if there's a high risk procedure, we try to have the fewest uh, number of people in the room um, and it seems like that's working out quite well. Um, but we didn't go to a, uh, to a model where residents are not allowed to take part in these patients. Okay. All right, let's go to another question from the audience. This is from Cassandra Clay. It's for Dr. McCarty. How are you handling sick attendings, residents, nurses, techs, paramedics, and other staff members with the limited testing capabilities currently? Are you sending sick team members home and for how long? Yeah, so the expectation here is that our providers are self-monitoring their symptoms at all times, even if they feel well. Again, checking their temperature twice a day and reporting to workforce health and safety whenever they develop any symptoms. If they happen to be at the hospital when they develop symptoms, they're sent home right away. They should already at baseline be wearing masks when they're in our hospital, as all our hospitals have instituted a mask in all settings in the hospital. But if they're not, they're encouraged to put a mask on and leave immediately. So again, I want to emphasize that none of the things that we're doing here are very are different from the State Department of Health guidelines, and each state is going to have their own particular guidance. So right now, for symptomatic providers, the, the minimum time that they're on quarantine is seven days. They can retur then return in New York State if they haven't had symptoms within the last 72, if, I'm sorry, if they haven't had a fever in the last 72 hours, and their symptoms are improving. Um, we've had multiple providers who had symptoms that have been able to return right at day seven when their symptoms came back. And again, this whole process has to be vetted through your workforce health and safety. We're not clearing them directly. They have to go through workforce health to get clearance to return to the emergency department. The, the one thing also I'll add is that this has really changed dramatically in a very short amount of time. So um, pretty much in less than a month, I'll say we started out uh, obviously with when the community spread was low, um, that our um, staff and providers were um, out in quarantine for 14 days. And I think as the numbers started rising, community spread started rising, and it was clear that uh, most of our workforce, et cetera, would be out, and many people were out uh, asymptomatic, uh, things change. So I think um, the lesson learned there is really, um, obviously, you'll, you will follow your state uh, department and institutional guidelines, but to be able to be um, sort of flexible, be able to pivot and um, think about how to use your uh, folks who are either out in quarantine if they're feeling well enough, um, as you heard some options tonight. Very good. Let's take another question from the audience. This uh, also comes from Rodrigo Merlos, uh, our colleague in Brazil. Uh, and obviously we've heard a lot in the news about uh, various uh, pharmacotherapies or possible pharmacotherapeutics. Have you used hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in your protocols? And if so, what results have you seen so far? Uh, this question is, is for Dr. Farmer, but I'd love to hear from a few different uh, panelists about this. So in New York, we have been trying to limit uh, prescript patients going home on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And part of that is related to drug shortages that are happening. And we want to make sure that the sickest patients in the hospital have access to those medications. Um, so we have not been sending patients home on them. A lot of our inpatient teams start ordering the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin as soon as those patients get admitted. Um, for our patients in 
all of our patients that get admitted have pneumonia on their chest x-rays from COVID-19. Um, most of our providers have been treating them with antibiotics right from the start and covering them with community acquired um, protocols like ceftriaxone and azithromycin. Um, and then the inpatient teams have been focusing on adding the hydroxychloroquine when they get admitted to the hospital. Are you uh, ever initiating uh, hydroxychloroquine in any of your emergency departments? Uh, I'd like to answer that. Um, I'm not going to say never because never is never the right. Never is not a right answer. Um, in general, these these are not benign medications. Uh, liver function tests, EKG abnormalities, QT prolongation. It's hard to monitor those through telehealth, and a lot of these people will not be able to gain access to monitor these medications appropriately. So it has to be the right patient with the right circumstance. But in general, uh, if somebody is stable enough, even the moderate COVID to be discharged from the ER, we don't recommend that. Anyone from any of the other campuses? We have some interesting data on um, antibiotic utilization and discontinuation, but I'd like one of my other colleagues to, to speak to that. We're getting a lot of calls for these medications. And I think the medicine we were being asked today about was ivermectin. Um, we are not prescribing medicines of no proven benefit to our patients who are at home with mild disease, uh, despite an awful lot of pressure from those same patients. It's probably important to remember that the standard of care from the CDC and the WHO is supportive care. And one of the things that, a couple of the things that uh, NYP is doing is pursuing some identified therapies for patients with COVID-19. One of those is hydroxychloroquine, which we just talked about. There's a finite amount of it and not a ton of proof that it really works. Um, but inpatient units are giving it uh, with some regularity. The other is remdesivir, which is investigational and was initially developed for Ebola, has widespread antiviral activity, has some in vitro anti-COVID activity, and it's eligible for some proven positive, generally sick patients in the hospital. Um, uh, and we're starting to enroll more. In terms of antibiotics, we were just sort of curious and pulled the data from our own faculty group just to see who was maybe discharging patients on antibiotics. And looking over the past month, it's, it's a very small percentage. Very few patients are going home with PO antibiotics um, who are presumed under investigation for COVID. And uh, when we look for what the bounce back rate is, we don't really see any of those patients coming back. Similarly, when we look at the number of patients who are being given antibiotics on their way into the hospital being admitted, uh, we are actually seeing the great majority of those antibiotics being DC'd by the inpatient teams within 48 to 72 hours. Are these patients uh, who have a demonstrated low bar pneumonia? Who are these patients? In general, just all patients under investigation. So the data that we looked at involved uh, any diagnosis of viral pneumonia, pneumonia, suspected viral infection, basically all comers. But drilling down, um, the people who, who really had antibiotics kept on were the ones who had you know, high procalcitonins who had high white counts, who had high fevers and protracted illnesses and were concerned for low bar infections, correct? Very good. Yeah, Mark, if yes. I could just Sorry, add, we... that, that sort of In speaks fact, to one of the, the big Dr. risks. Sharmer. Go ahead, Dr. Sharma. No. Um, I just wanted to add that we don't, uh, when we admit somebody, that we obviously consult really phenomenal infectious disease colleagues uh, who also guide the treatment on the inpatient floors. So while we, we're saying that they're discontinuing it. This is all under the guidance of the infectious disease department once a patient's admitted. Sure. Very good. All right, let's take another question from the audience. This next one comes from Dave Gordon. It's for Dr. Manish Sharma. And are you using uh, inflammatory labs like CRP, D dimers, ferritin, LDH, and others to make decisions about disposition for the patient? As Dr. Farmer um, pointed out, <clears throat> excuse me. The moderate risk patients are getting a subset of labs. Those, uh, a lot of those are pretty standard for most campuses. Some of them are suggested. Uh, in general, uh, we're doing inflammatory markers, CBC, 
procalcitonin and a basic metabolic. And we're once again, making a clinical judgment. Um, those inflammatory markers are not determining the disposition. It's how the patient does after an initial trial period, um, what they look like, how they act, and obviously they have to have a saturation over 90% on exertion. Um, once again, every lab is treated as a, uh, an indicator towards the disposition. If you have a white count of 18 in a patient, you're obviously not gonna lean towards discharging them. If the procalcitonin is high, you're obviously not going to discharge them. But I'm saying is a lot of these labs are used as reassurance that you're making the right decision. Very good. Let's take another question. Have, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Ron. No, I would just add that um, the even the decision to proceed to labs is already meaning that you're shifting towards or considering admission. Um, we're not using this at all for patients that we think look well enough to be going home. Very good. So our next question comes from Chana Engelman. This is for Dr. Olson. For the no nurse model, were the patients being triaged? And if so, what model are you using? Yeah, so um, the patients would walk in the door and they would, um, if they were ambulatory, um, they would get a set of vital signs done. Um, if their chief complaint was cough and cold or any of the common symptoms, uh, they would go into this process. Um, we used 90% as our cutoff for oxygen saturation. And then it was up to the provider once they spoke further with the patient to decide if, the, if they should be a discharge home or if they should actually come inside for further workup. Thank you. So our next question um, is for Dr. Manish Sharma as well, but I'd love to also get some e input from some of our other panelists. Would, you, would we even consider CPR in COVID patients? I'm happy to answer that. Uh, yes, um, it's a very complex decision. Um, it has nothing to do with one thing. It has to do with the entire picture of the patient, um, functional status prior to their cardiac arrest, um, likelihood of return to a functional status. <clears throat> and even when you proceed with the CPR, as Dr. Romney pointed out, we're doing a supraglottic airway, preferentially, and only putting in a definitive airway if there is return of circulation. So it's a very difficult and a complicated answer that I can't say yes or no to. Mm. Okay. Any others want to weigh in on that question? One, one thing that's happened in our community is that uh, New York City EMS, maybe New York State EMS, has stopped transport of patients at this point um, for those without return to spontaneous circulation after 20 minutes attempt at resuscitation. Um, uh, so we're seeing fewer patients uh, transported to the emergency department with CPR in progress. Okay. No, not, not an easy decision at all. Maybe I could add something, um, not, not specific to CPR, but maybe a little bit related, um, but just to point out that um, if you are lucky enough to have palliative care services at your institution, um, starting to get them involved early um, as you're starting to see increased cases uh, is really critical. Um, we have had palliative care with us, uh, and they'll actually come down and round in the ED. And just less than a week of their first week there, they saw over 30 consults. And it's just been critical. They um, are spending hours with patients FaceTiming and calling families. And I think um, it's just been a, a, a crucial um, resource that's helped to uh, take care of these patients. Very good. Well, let's take a few more questions. So the next one's for Dr. Steele. Um, how are you triaging uh, critically injured patients uh, who may not be able to provide uh, history? Are you presuming that they are COVID positive? We, we are presuming that they are COVID positive, but it's a, it's a, it's a great question um, because say for example, a trauma uh, they could have incurred trauma because they were febrile and pre and crossed the street at that time. So I'd like my colleague, Dr. Bodnar, one of the assistant directors of clinical service, 
to answer that in detail about what provisions we make in the clean area of the ED if we're not sure if the patient has COVID or not. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, so initially it was, it was difficult to decipher when it wasn't endemic in the community, but once it became endemic in the community for COVID, we had to treat all patients as if they were presumed COVID positive. So every time a trauma, which we usually do in all circumstances, is everybody is in full PPE until we can make other clinical decisions. And once there's a more extensive assessment, and, and specifically if a patient needs something that would be more dangerous to providers, such as an aerosolizing procedure, uh, the patient would be appropriately in a room that is a negative pressure to perform those if, if possible. Additionally, if the patient is more stable and they've come in and they, they, they seem to be that we think that they're in what we call a clean area, but there is determined after they come in that they're more high risk that we believe that they may be COVID positive, then we can move them into some of our other areas, which we're calling dirty or more closed units where people are more on high alert for the illness. Okay. I so, think another thing to point out is that our hospital system has made the decision to test any patient that is being admitted to the hospital for COVID-19. And that is because we have found so many patients that didn't meet initial criteria for testing. Another reason for that is because uh, we do have places we can transfer non-COVID patients and we don't want to start two days later. We wanna start upfront, just knowing they're COVID negative so the transfer can happen so we can accept more COVID patients into our hospital, hospitals, sorry. In terms of uh, leading uh, your institution, you absolutely want to advocate for your lab resources to not batch their COVID testing if they have the capacity to not batch. The reason for that is you don't want a patient boarding in the ED for 20 hours waiting for their COVID test to come back. We've, we've been the victim of that, but thankfully on Monday, we're gonna start unbatching at Cornell um, and that will free up much better flow out of the ED. Um, they are obviously taking it very seriously on the floors, but particularly in the ICUs of having clean and contaminated ICUs. So partner with labs early on that batching culture. Excellent point. Uh, so our next question comes from Sai Rajagopalan. It's for Dr. Romney and it's PPE related. We've had a number of PPE uh, related questions. So would you share your experience and any lessons learned or that you've heard of from colleagues elsewhere in the city about the use of ad hoc PPE? So for example, 3D print, printed parts uh, as a last resort. Um, yes, we actually have some of our colleagues who have worked um, to create shields um, that we've been distributing to frontline staff. This isn't in lieu of traditional PPE, but has actually been used as another layer of protection to help extend the life of um, the N95 masks that we're wearing. Um, so they've been using 3D, 3D printing for that. Okay, very good. Uh, the next question, um, I'm gonna, uh, this is for Dr. Raul Sharma. Um, so how do you handle your homeless population that tests positive and can't easily self-isolate? So uh, great question. So we have a very robust program with our social workers and care managers. Um, for patients that are homeless and who do test positive, uh, we do end up admitting them. Um, and obviously we can't discharge them anywhere. But now uh, we have to come up with creative ways with our social workers and care managers to figure out alternative sites where we could send them to. So the answer is that it's, it's we don't have a definite answer, but uh, some of these patients do end up getting admitted. And, and, and uh, Dr. Farmer, you go ahead. Wait, yeah, I wanna uh, make a comment. Social work and care coordination have gotten new information from Department of Homeland Services and the Office of Emer Emergency Management for the city of New York who have opened up extra shelters for COVID positive uh, undomiciled patients to go to that allows for appropriate um, isolation. However, 
some of our homeless population have other medical conditions that prevent them from going, such as a BKA or they, they have a wheelchair or, or something along those lines. And those patients we wind up having to keep in the hospital. By the way, that excellent question came from Meredith Thompson. Uh, a related uh, question is, how have you approached the patients presenting with psychiatric needs or from group homes? And I'll open that to the panel. Uh, I can say that the one exception um, that Nick was talking, sorry, Dr. Gavin was talking about, about who we test and we don't test, and we test and we test and we don't. I'm going to silence. I'll sign out. I'll sign out. I think what Dr. Sharma was trying to say is those are the exceptions for patients that would normally be able to be discharged. Those are patients that we continue to test because we can, we, we want to make sure that we're not releasing anybody back to a group home or a community setting um, that's COVID positive. So those patients, even if they are well enough to be discharged, we make sure we test them before we send them out to the community. Some of our psychiatric facilities have been able to take COVID positive patients, but they need to have been tested before they get discharged or transferred to those facilities so that they can make sure that they have the appropriate PPE for their staff and that the patient has the number of masks that they need. Excellent, thank you all. So let's, uh, let's take a question um, from Elisa Hayes. This is an education related question. How are residents and medical students being deployed to assist in the response and also keep them safe and preserve PPE? I'll open so, up. Um, I can. Go ahead, Angela. Go ahead. go ahead, Angela. Sure. Yeah, maybe I'll start with the, the medical students. So um, our uh, institutions have decided to um, uh, pull the medical students from the clinical spaces. Um, they have been redeployed in a number of areas. There's groups that are obviously volunteering. Um, they're doing things like phone follow-up uh, from patients who are discharged home um, and uh, other, other things and other options that don't, uh, aren't uh, direct patient facing, I'll say. Um, I know that Columbia will be graduating our fourth year medical students early this year, April 15th, and then after that, uh, they will be allowed to function and be, quote, hired, if you will, from the hospital um, as interns early after they graduate. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I same thing, what Angela said, um, we're still trying to uh, figure out a way to utilize some of these medical students, especially the ones who will have gotten their MD degrees. So they're doctors, I guess, um, uh, several months earlier. Uh, so we've actually come up, we're coming up with a plan where we can incorporate them into our workflows. So what are some of the workflows that you're considering incorporating them in? So some people have suggested if they help in uh, some screening exams, seeing some of these uh, uh, COVID clinics, uh, patients there, even telemedicine. Um, but, you know, I think we have to make sure that we have high quality standards and, and training. Peter, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I think... Um... There's education needed all around with this disease. Um, patients uh, need to know when to come into the hospital. If they're discharged from the hospital, they need to know when to come back. And that's a great place to employ medical students. We put them in some of our call lines. Also, some carefully circumscribed and supervised telemedicine workflows, we've employed them. And the same thing can be done with residents. So just as Dr. Sharma was saying, you do have to um, think carefully about who you're putting where and make sure that you don't overface anyone or put them outside of an appropriate place for them to be working. Um, this patient education thing is incredibly important. If I could just share a quick story, just before this call started, one of our telemedicine service lines took care of a person in their 50s who was short of breath all day long and didn't want to call for help. Um, eventually called for help uh, to deteriorate rapidly in front of the telemedicine team with a, a story that's not going to have a good ending. Uh, patients need to know uh, what dyspnea and shortness of breath looks like so that they can make the right decisions to access medical care. And with all our discharge pathways, all our patient education really needs to stress that. Excellent. Uh, 
Our next question, this is for uh, the entirety of the panel. What has been your experience with chest radiographs or even CT scans? Do they, do the findings help you gauge the severity of illness and guide the emergency department management? I'll open that to the group. I'm gonna try and answer this. Hopefully I don't get feedback. <clears throat> there is no utility of a chest X-ray because the majority of patients um, who can have a saturation of 92, 93% or 87% or 84% can have very similar radiographs. Um, it is unlikely, in my opinion, anybody with a saturation of 97% will have an abnormal X-ray, but it's possible also. So if you, Dr. Brenna, uh, farmers, if I, I call it your, sorry, your pathway, Brenna, sorry. The pathway clearly outlines that a chest X-ray should be considered at a later point, and usually when you're admitting somebody, not to guide your disposition. Very good. I would just like to add just one thing to that. That's perfectly stated. The only, I think, utility in this disease for a chest X-ray is if there's diagnostic ambiguity. If you think that they may not have COVID, the, the chest X-ray might be helpful because we see the characteristic pattern if you're looking for other illness, but does not alter disposition decision-making. I could add one thing, Ian. Yes. So I think one of the biggest risks with this disease is anchor bias. Um, and this was particularly true kind of um, midway through the, the curve. When you're in, a, in, a, in the middle of a crisis, it's all that you see. And all of us have stories of patients who, you know, felt unwell, felt a little achy, maybe had some flank pain with a mild cough and had some completely different disease process, cholecystitis, pyelonephritis. Um, I, I think it's really critical to, to remind folks of the dangers of, of anchor bias um, and, and to consider that with every patient. How do you instruct your learners to guard against that potential error? Well, I think what's been nice, um, you know, particularly with the telehealth mechanisms of evaluating patients, is we've actually been able to slow down and uh, get a good history and perform a proper physical. Um, and on the patients who are um, extremely ill and um, tachypnic and, and are kind of our, our classic COVID patients, we've tried to incorporate bedside ultrasound whenever possible um, to also assess for cardiac dysmotility. Um, so really keeping everything, uh, using all of the tools in our armamentarium. Excellent. I will say that all of our COVID pathway order sets that we have on all of our campuses always include a troponin, always include an EKG. We include the chest x-ray for uh, everything mentioned um, previously, but it is to help us make sure that we aren't missing the other diagnoses that could these patients could have. We rarely right now, but we do still see patients that have just an asthma exacerbation or just a CHF exacerbation. We still are worried about COVID, but we still have to treat those disease processes as well. Excellent points. Maybe so, one thing just to add about CAT scans is <clears throat> there was maybe some slight misapplication of literature coming out of China early. Um, and there were folk who kind of misinterpreted a paper by saying CAT scan early because CAT scan findings become positive before someone tests positive for COVID. The reason I say that's misapplication of the science is if you look, the devil's always in the details, and if you look closely at that paper, it took four days for the test results of the COVID test to come back. Uh, so in that particular cohort with really very long delays in testing, yes, the CAT scan came back positive before the results come back. But I think most of the US tests will have a turnaround of less than 24 hours, leaving very little space for CT, or I'll go so far as to say no space for CT as a diagnostic modality. Great point. Thank you, Dr. Steele. So there, there were a couple questions that have come in from our audience. By the way, audience, please continue to send your excellent questions in that are uh, wondering about um, what precautions are each of you taking in terms of protecting your families at home during this pandemic. So maybe we'll take uh, three or four of you to uh, tell us how you've been protecting yourself and protecting your families. 
I'm happy to start. Um, I make sure that I go straight from the home right into the bathroom, take everything off, shower before I even enter the common spaces where my family lives. I have the luxury of having an additional bathroom that's separate from the one my kids use. So that's become kind of the COVID bathroom and I'm the only one that uses it so that I can kind of decontaminate. Other things that people can do though is, as I mentioned earlier, is bringing a change of clothes so that you're not leaving the hospital with um, you know, the clothes that you've worked in in the ED and making sure to wash your hands um, and disinfect everything, your stethoscope, all the things that you're bringing home with you um, before leaving the hospital. Yeah, um, Ian, this is Rahul. So one thing, one, one thing that uh, my leadership team would tell you is I basically banned all meetings um, of greater than one person. Um, uh, pretty much, you know, even if they're down the hall, we're not meeting with each other. Everyone now the hospital has an all masks policy um, across the whole New York Presbyterian enterprise. Every single person now walking in, um, family member, patient, staff are now all masked. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really trying to uh, prevent, you know, infection. And, um, and, and, and the one thing that we found is if the faculty have the goggles on, the masks on, and, and do it appropriately, that decreases your chances of infection. It really does. Um, we could get an entire discussion about, you know, PPE and everything like that. But in the end, it comes down to adhering to basic principles, which is don't meet with people, keep your distance, and Zoom is a great platform right now. Excellent. One, one other thing I'll, I'll add is that um, we worked with our hospital leadership to be able to have access for our group to be able to use showers, uh, you know, call room showers in the, in the hospital. And um, the other thing, which I don't know that a, a lot of people take taken advantage of, but it's available, is that the school, because the, um, all the students are, are home, uh, have made the dorm rooms available for folks if they would like to um, stay on campus. Um, and they provide three meals a day. Um, so that's something that people can uh, sign up for. And I know that you know, there are some folks that might live with an immunocompromised family member or other um, people in their home that they don't want exposed to. So that's been another um, great uh, oppor opportunity for people. Excellent. I think one of the things to add is um, besides the not meeting in person and using Zoom or teleconference or however else is, um, like Marie, I, I change as soon as I get home and I've gone to only wearing scrubs. I don't dress professionally. Um, it is scrubs and a white coat if I'm sitting in front of a camera. It is um, and it, on, in the ED, it's, I bring my scrubs and change into them um, and take them home and they go right in the laundry when I get home. And um, I have a five-year-old son and my husband's also an emergency physician. And we make sure that he knows that he has to let us get changed and showered before we have contact with him. And one thing that we all have in common on this call is we work in a New York City ER. Uh, that has very little walls, lots of curtains, uh, lots of stretchers next to each other. Um, washing hands is by far the most important thing and the thing that's always been a challenge in any overcrowded ER. Sure. Um, I think that will change a lot after this. Luckily, something good comes of something horrible, uh, but people are washing their hands more. There's more Purell around, but just honestly, simply washing your hands in between touching anything is probably the most important thing you can do. Excellent. So there are a couple questions and uh, we have about 12 minutes um, left. So we'll have maybe uh, nine minutes or so for questions. Uh, there have been a couple questions um, about uh, how did you fund the, uh, the portable uh, pulse oximetry devices? So perhaps you can give a little insight into that. Um, that's easy, the hospital paid for it. Um, essentially, uh, you know, that's what it came down to. The hospital, our senior leadership um, has been very supportive to all of our uh, programs um, over the last several years. But basically, we told them we wanted it, and the next day we had them. So that's the simple answer. Okay. Uh, every pulse ox and every pulse ox, uh, sorry, oxygen concentrator means one less admitted patient in an overcrowded ER. So the administration fully understands that, and they made it possible. So there are a couple of questions that have come in from the audience as well, really wanting to drill down on your, uh, your use of 
telehealth uh, for remote monitoring and uh, creating so safe discharge of these patients. So maybe uh, Dr. Olson, you could walk us through a little more specifics about that program. There's a lot of curiosity online about that. Uh, sure. And Dr. Greenwald, I appreciate your response as well. Right, I was gonna say uh, we could talk it through together. Um, so, so are we talking about um, communicating with patients who were discharged home with oxygen uh, concentrators? Is that, is that the question? Yep. There was a question around that for sure. But I think people were also just interested in general, even the patient who was, uh, had mild symptoms, who could be safely discharged, how were you able to stand up a program using a telehealth platform uh, to okay. remotely monitor those patients? Sure, so I'll, I'll start off with that patient. So in those patients who were dischargeable home, uh, we have an act, we built into uh, EPIC, um, an actual uh, order. Um, they worked on it pretty quickly for us. And so if I'm a physician and I'm discharging a patient, I click on this follow-up order button and it generates a list of patients that we can um, then give to our follow-up team. Um, the team, there are different teams involved. Uh, one of them that I'll just mention happens to be a pool of nurse practitioners. And they will every day take that list of names and they will start out with a phone call to the patients. Um, these are patients who did not necessarily have the skill to or, or have the familiarity with doing a virtual visit, they physically came into the department. And so we start with a phone call and if possible, we can expand it to a virtual visit. Um, but they do the assessment just like Dr. Greenwell kind of showed in that video where they uh, reassess their, uh, how they're breathing. Um, they go through a, a little bit of an algorithm and if they have any questions about it, they can contact any of the physicians at either Cornell or Columbia were available to them uh, to discuss. And if they have any concern, the patient gets sent to the emergency department. Um, otherwise, the patient gets a call the following day. We try to follow these patients for at least uh, three days. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Dr. Greenwell, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, so uh, variations on what Dr. Olson just said are happening across the enterprise using different pools of providers, but we have gotten together and have a uniform set of criteria. We're looking at both dyspnea on exertion, tachypnea on, on exertion, and oxygen saturations. And we're using, a, if a person can't keep their oxygen saturation above 90%, after they've been discharged, when they were able to, before they were discharged, we're bringing them back. Um, I happened to be nearby when the nurse practitioner group that Dr. Olson was talking about called me to be medical backup on a call they were uncertain of today. And I um, had the ability to, because I was nearby, just go in room and watch the visit. And I'm watching a man on an oxygen concentrator walk at bedside, standing at bedside uh, while his family member was actually assisting with translation. And this gentleman who uh, two days ago was able to do that at 92% in the hospital on um, uh, off oxygen, now is dipping down to 88% on four liters per minute. Needless to say, we brought him back and he's been admitted. Um, but it's one story like that after another. Um, I do wanna mention that we're not sure what the best prognostic indicator is. There's some discussion about, uh, I'm not sure anybody with this disease is happy, but people who don't look that distressed when they're hypoxic. Um, we don't know if this pulse ox is the best indicator or if the dyspnea is the best indicator. We don't know when people are going to deteriorate. We're going to hope to get data out about that, but we're seeing people who are deteriorating day four, day five sometimes. We're seeing people who are deteriorating the day after we send them home from the hospital. So it's really important that we keep close follow-up. And by the way, Dr. Olson just mentioned three days. We're following patients longer than that. Uh, in this program, there are some handoffs. Um, and I think we need to follow patients longer than that. Could I, could I, could I make a comment, uh, Dr. Martin? So yeah. um, the one thing that I would really highly recommend to all of the um, different leaders out there who are listening in is 
whether you're in New York or another city, start leveraging your hospital leadership to get you these resources, to put these programs into place. You are not gonna be able to do this by yourself in the ED, you are not. You need help from your senior leadership, from your depart other departments, departments that are gonna cancel elective surgeries. You need their help to help do these follow-up phone calls. Our on-demand program would not be possible if it weren't for these redeployed physicians. Our follow-up program, the telehealth program, would not be f uh, possible if it weren't for that. You can't expect your faculty to be doing everything. So start having those conversations tonight. You know, you could say, we heard this great program at New York Presbyterian, Cornell, Columbia. Let's do the same exact thing now before it gets bad. Great point, Dr. Sharma. Dr. Farmer. Um, one thing to add to all this uh, information around our telemedicine follow-up program is that when we've reached, some of our campuses have very robust primary care uh, offices that are ready to take these patients in handoff. Um, we've also found some hesitation on the side of our primary care colleagues because they're getting calls and they would be following up patients that they would normally be admitting to the hospital, particularly those with exertional hypoxia and with those that are on O2 concentrators. So being able to build this program from the beginning and getting the buy-in and helping your colleagues and other services realize that we're trying to expand inpatient medicine to the outpatient service uh, is a way of thinking about taking care of these patients in a disaster setting. And it does take our colleagues and other specialties a little bit more time to get comfortable with that. So the sooner you can have that conversation to help build those, those follow-up plans, the better. Dr. Sharma, you'll get the last word. Um, the generosity of people we talked about um, in terms of food coming to the hospital and all the other things, the, the physicians and providers who right now feel helpless want to help you. You have to be open to it. You just have to guide them the right way. Excellent. Well, that'll have to be our final question of the evening. Thank you again, Dr. Gavin, and to the rest of tonight's speakers for sharing your incredible stories and for helping the rest of the country prepare just a little bit better for the COVID-19 pandemic at their own hospitals. So Dr. Gavin, with that, I'm gonna uh, give you an opportunity to say any final remarks you might have. Thank you, Dr. Martin. As you all can tell from tonight's presentation, this pandemic has forced us to think about emergency care in a new way. As this disaster demonstrates and as new disasters and diseases evidence themselves, we'll continue to be on the forefront of healthcare, ready to innovate and create new solutions to the problems that present themselves. Since the day that I walked into Highland Hospital as an intern full of pride and hope, I've never been more proud to be a part of this community. I'm so grateful to be part of such a strong community of people who work tirelessly and selflessly to care for anyone and everyone that walks through the door. Special thanks to the advocates within our community who continue to fight for the most vulnerable among us. In closing, I just wanna thank all of the emergency care teams across the world for your bravery and dedication in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you to SAM for providing a community and forum for us to share information and our experiences as we did here tonight. Thank you all. Dr. Gavin, it's certainly been our pleasure and honor to host this event. Thank you again to our speakers and to all of our viewers for joining us tonight. Stay safe and good night.